Brethren, I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So good to have you again here today for us to study. I just want us to take two, three minutes to pray for the world. I want to read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to probably 3 or 4. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We are aware of the war in <clears throat> Ukraine, the attack of Russia on Ukraine. I believe Satan is behind this. He wants to destroy people. That's his mission, to kill, to steal, and to destroy, to steal, kill, and destroy. But we are urged to pray, first of all, for, those, for kings and those in authority. So I want us to take time. You can unmute yourself. And we pray for this war to end. The goal of this war is to destroy lives. And God is not pleased that people who are not saved should be destroyed. God wants us to live peaceful, quiet lives, godly lives, and holy lives. War does not bring peace. War does not help people to live quiet lives. War doesn't encourage godly living or holy living. And it says peaceful living, quiet living, godly living, and holy living are pleasing to God. So let's just take time and pray for uh, the people of Ukraine and even Russia, let's pray that this war will end. That's the goal for this short prayer. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we acknowledge you tonight as the Lord of heaven and earth. We call upon you in the name of Jesus for this war in the Ukraine to end. This Russian aggression against Ukraine that he hopes to destroy lives beyond Ukraine, Father, we call it to end in the name of Jesus. Lord, you are the one who make it peace, who command peace, oh God, to, who command wars to end. So we call upon you to command this, this war to end in the name of Jesus. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Father, we thank you. Over the name of God. We thank you. For this evil, O oh God, that the enemy wants to bring up all the earth to end. He knows that, Lord, many people are not saved. 3.2 billion are not saved. 3.4 billion are not saved. And he wants to destroy this life. Father, we say no to the devil. We say no to this advance. We command peace on the earth. We command peace on the earth. The Lord will not do the work you have told us to do in the name of Jesus. We say we should pray for those in authority. We pray for Putin at this moment. Those in authority in Russia. That God you will touch his heart. You will change his heart. The heart of things that you have. So Father, touch the heart of Putin. Touch him, oh Change him, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Give Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Father. Father God, we thank you. Lord of heaven and earth, we worship you. You make it wars to cease. We ask you, Lord, that this war between Russia and Ukraine will cease right away in the name of Jesus. The heart of King. Bible says, and your hands. So, Lord, yes, we command Lord. that tonight the heart of Putin, that the heart of Putin be controlled by you, Lord, in the Amen. direction of Amen. peace, in the name yes. of Jesus. We resist yes, the devil of darkness that has come upon him, and we say, Amen. No more bloodshed in the name of Jesus. It is Amen. your pleasure that we should live in peace. So, Lord, we Amen. receive peace. 
peace so that we evangelize the world because you do not want anyone to die and go to her. Father, we thank you. We commit yes. our Bible study tonight to you. We bring our uncle Peter Ozodo to you that you will use him, Lord, as your oracle to speak to us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for praying for the world tonight. Uncle Peter, we're so happy once again to come together and uh, sit under your grace. May the Lord again use you tonight to minister to us. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, my dear brother. I will praise the Lord for the opportunity and the privilege to share together. These are very difficult times uh, worldwide and the tension is getting higher uh, by the day. Uh, but the key thing for us to note as believers, two key things to note, no matter how this thing boils over, our God is in total control. Um, uh, um, the people threatening the use of nuclear weapons and so on and so forth should not cause us any fear because um, absolutely the Lord is in total control. And we know that uh, he has a plan and a program uh, and um, no man can thwart that program. Uh, I was writing a brother today and I was telling him that uh, it gets to a point in God's schedules that not even our prayers can change his program. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't pray, but uh, that's to say that we should pray with a heart of calmness and uh, not worry or get anxious. In any case, even if the very worst happens, and uh, we are taken out of this world by a sudden explosion or anything like that, we just go to heaven, that's all. So there's really nothing for Christians or believers to worry about uh, in, in times like this, apart from what we have been urged to do to pray, uh, because those who are not Christians are perishing. And uh, we have a duty to take the gospel to them and we can best do that in the context of peace. So we give thanks to God. Um, today we are going to make a start in a new topic. Uh, we're going to be considering the church. Um, the church from the perspective of growth. Uh, church growth. Uh, I've called it church planting here, but really uh, I'll be looking at church growth. Uh, it will include planting of churches, but what we are really interested in is to see uh, the growth of, of, of the church along the lines uh, uh, that we have just prayed, that the gospel of Jesus Christ <clears throat> may reach the whole world and reach every perishing soul before they perish. Um, um, we have churches all over the world. In fact, all of us are members of churches. If I asked you, how well is your church doing? Some of us are pastors. Some of us are leaders in churches. So how well is your church doing? That's... Um, a question that calls for evaluation. Uh, and in order to evaluate ourselves effectively as church, we need to have a basis against which we can measure. If you say somebody is uh, tall or short, uh, you're actually talking about measuring one thing against a standard. Right, there's a standard, or if you like, an average uh, that people's heights are. So if somebody is uh, much higher than that standard, we say he's tall, very tall. Or if he's less than that standard, we say, oh, that person is short, uh, and so on. So for the same with churches, uh, how do we measure our churches except we have a yardstick 
a basis, an agreed basis upon which we can measure. The only objective standard for the true measurement of any church <clears throat> must be the Bible. The Bible, because that's what actually introduces us to the idea of church. Um, it's in the Bible we find that Jesus talks about his church. Uh, and so if we are going to measure whether our church is doing well or is not doing well, we will, uh, it will be best to measure it, not against how people see uh, doing well or how human beings judge wellness or progress, uh, not as though it was a, a business organization. And so we're looking at the bottom line or it is a political organization. And so we're looking at fame, but uh, the way the Bible defines it. So we're gonna have to find how the Bible defines it. What does the Bible, what does the Bible say the church is? That's a very interesting question. What does the Bible say the church is? In other words, how does the Bible define the term church? Uh, many of us have never really bothered to ask that kind of question. Uh, we grow, grew up in a church, and so we say that's a church. Or we use that as a standard to measure all churches, to say that the one we are familiar with is the standard. Uh, the Bible has something to say about what church is. What does it prescribe as its reason for being, right? Why does the church exist as far as the Bible is concerned? To discuss the extent to which the church's programs and projects are effective, we need to first determine the end to which the system is meant to serve. So uh, a lot of churches, so it's not just the churches, even in a particular given church, uh, they have programs, they have projects. And so they want to measure, is this program effective? Is this project serving its purpose? Uh, and the standard again by which we we'll measure it will be determined by the end to which the entire church pro project is, the, is, is meant to serve. What is the church supposed to do? What is the church supposed to serve? And therefore, are these programs, these projects we are trying to do in the church, are they effective? There are some things that we just do because we see others doing. Other things we do because we think, oh, that's what churches do. But how does that relate to what the Bible says the church ought to be or the purpose of the church ought to be? And so to consider these uh, objectives or this uh, uh, issue of what the purpose of the church ought to be, we want to start by looking at certain principles that the Bible provides us with which uh, we can say the church is undergirded. That is to say, these are the, the principles that support the church. These are the pillars upon which the, the church stands. So when we understand these principles, we will then be able to say, uh, is what we are doing serving these principles or are they according to these principles? The first principle is what I've called precise identification. The church uh, has a precise identification. Um, who is going to read for us today? Philemon, Philemon Magwape, can you read for us please? Uh, this passage, Matthew 16, 13 to 16. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Matthew. Good evening, Thank you. Matthew 13 to 16. Chapter 16, yes. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, 
He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Oh, sorry, I've just lost my, my reading here. It went off. Oh, no. I was reading from the phone. And it's we'll just for you. Thank you. Let me just read from the speaking from the Bible now. Amen. Uh, I'm now, uh, I've moved now to the. Uh, Start all over. Uh, Matthew 16, 13 to 16. Yes. When. Now, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the uh, prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an interesting journey, uh, a sort of field trip by Jesus and his disciples. Um, Caesarea Philippi was uh, at the outskirts of uh, what was considered to be Israel at the time of Jesus. So he went to the extreme uh, of uh, the territory. Uh, uh, and uh, we know that when he returned from that journey, he returned to Jerusalem, uh, and that was the end of his ministry on earth. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So this was like the end of the training of the apostles. And uh, in, a, in a very interesting way, it seemed to be a fitting a final examination for them. And uh, the single question in the test was, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Uh, who do they say that I am? Uh, uh, and of course, the answer was some say you are uh, uh, the prophet Elijah, others say you are John the Baptist, and so on. Uh, and he said to them, okay, that's what they say. Now, who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter answered uh, in a fitting and a final way, uh, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. So that was a very precise identification. It's very interesting that the final question Jesus was asking them was, who am I? Who whom am I? And it's interesting, even in the context of the church issue that we're talking about. Uh, verse 18 of the same passage, uh, verse 18 of that same Matthew 16. Um, uh, Sister Abigail, would you please read it for us? Good evening, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, nice. Matthew 16, 18. Yeah. And, and so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation I will build my church, and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. Okay, very good. Uh, so the question, the point was, Jesus had just asked them, <laughs> who do men say that I am? And then when they had answered, he says, who do you say that I am? And uh, uh, Peter answered uh, effectively. And Jesus said, you know, uh, you are Peter. I call you Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. Now, quite a number of people uh, have various views on what Jesus meant when he said on this rock. Uh, some of them feel that he meant to say the rock Peter. Uh, um, but 
the words rock, although in English it appears to be one word, the same word on this rock. Uh, in the Greek, which was the original language in, in which this passage was written, the, the words are different. So when it says uh, you are Peter, uh, Peter means rock, but it's not the same as a rock that he dances on, on this rock. Uh, so there are two different words translated rock. Uh, so he wasn't referring to Peter, obviously is what I'm saying, and we'll see it in a moment. Uh, uh, but um, he was referring to the rock <coughs> of his personal identity or personal identification. Who is Jesus, all right, is the rock, the identification of Jesus as the Messiah, as the son of the living God, is the rock upon which he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The church is not built on Simon Peter. The church is built on the fact that Jesus, this Jesus, who was standing before the apostles in Caesarea Philippi, is the son of the living God. He is the Messiah, the one that Israel had been expecting to come. Up till today, many, many Jews, in fact, most Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's why they are not part of the Christian church. And that's why, and that's because uh, uh, they're not standing on this rock. They have not identified Jesus as a Messiah. Anybody who doesn't identify Jesus as a Messiah, can I put it this way? Anybody who does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah cannot be a Christian and therefore cannot be a, a member of the church that Jesus is building, all right? So uh, Jesus says, I'm building a church. The foundation of this church is the fact that I am the Messiah. That's the first principle uh, that determines membership, that determines whether we are a church or not, is that Jesus is the Messiah, all right? Uh, the next thing is uh, the what I've called here uh, propriety, a proprietor acclamation. That is to say that the owner of the building, the owner of the church is Jesus. I will build on this rock, in that verse it says, on this rock I will build what? My church, my church is not your church. You know, some pastors are very funny. Uh, they say, well, if you don't, this is my church. If you don't like it, go. Go and uh, start your own or go and join another church. No, it's not your church, sir. The church belongs to Jesus. If it is a proper church, it belongs to Jesus. And so uh, uh, in that verse 16, Jesus proclaims the fact that he is the proprietor of the church, all right? So we have this precise identification. We have a permanent foundation, this rock, all right? And he proclaims himself to be the proprietor, all right? I will build my church, not uh, Peter Ozodo's church, not, uh, um, David Abam's church or anybody else's church. The church does not belong to the pastor. The church does not belong to the person who calls himself the founder. The church belongs to Jesus. Very important. Okay. Uh, uh, can we read that passage again, Sister Abigail, that verse 18? <clears throat> verse 18, and so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock, and on this rock foundation, I will build my church, 
and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. Uh, which version are you reading? Good news translation. Wow. All <laughs> right. Uh, can we get uh, a more... Um, uh, uh, let, let's get an IV. Okay, sir. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay. All right. It's not just death, but the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, as it's said in the King James Version. Uh, the gates of Hades uh, will not overcome it. Now, when you use the word overcome, it means that there's a conflict, right? Uh, there's a conflict. Uh, somebody is trying to overcome the church right from the beginning. He says, I will build my church on this rock, All right? So he's a proprietor. I am the one building it. I am building it on this rock. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now, and as, as I was saying, when you use the word overcome, it means there's a fight, there's a conflict. There is somebody trying to overcome the church. So you can see immediately that right from its very beginning, the church is set in a state of conflict. All right. There's a war on. There's a fight on. Uh, I've, 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 I said pugnacious intention. All right. Because the church is in conflict, is fighting. Pugnacious means fight. Okay. It means war. So the church is set up in a state of warfare. And the church is always in conflict. Not, uh, uh, how do I put it? Let me explain what I mean. He says, the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Now, gates, uh, well, let, me, let me get a help from somebody. Uh, Precious, what is a gate? What's a gate? Um. My definition, or you want me to check the dictionary? Uh, do you want you to check the dictionary? Please tell me. Uh, a gate is just a passageway by which uh, there is entry into something. So you can enter through a gate, which is maybe an open door or a closed door. Or... Do you yeah. enter through a closed door? <laughs> no, it's an open door. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so a gate, uh, actually, what's the real idea? If it's just to enter, do we need a gate? No, it's, it's a, like, um, it's a security measure. Okay, to do it. what? For what purpose? It prevents unwanted guests from entering. All right, so it's actually a preventative measure to keep out unwanted people, all right? Now, gates don't normally move out of where they are placed. In other words, you can open the gate, you can close the gate, but it doesn't leave where it's going and come out. So when he says the gates of hell, or whether you call it the gates of Hades, or you call it the gates of death, whatever gate it is, does not move. It doesn't leave the wall on which it's situated. So if it's coming, it's going to fight, if there's a fight uh, at a gate, what's the fight about? It, or, or rather, the, the fight is not um, instituted or or, 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 or set up by the gate itself, all right? The fight might be at the gate. The fight is normally by the person who is trying to enter forcefully into the gate. Uh, 
that's the person that is doing the fighting. So the question now is, when Jesus says the gates of hell shall not prevail uh, against the church, who is doing the fighting? Who is doing the pushing? Boyd, Banda, can you help me with this? Who is doing the fighting? Who is doing the pushing? Uh, I would put it that uh, the person who's doing the pushing uh, is an enemy of that. Uh, one of that the gate. gate. Yeah. Oh, okay, very good. Is the enemy of that gate. In the context of verse, six, verse 18 that we are reading, who is doing the pushing? Jesus says, uh, uh, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who is doing the pushing? It's Jesus himself. No. Look at it again. In the pushing. Who? The is devil. The no, it's not the devil. <laughs> no, look at that verse again. I want everybody to look at that verse closely. Uh, the gates of hell the shall church. not prevail against it. Okay? Yes, yeah, Sister Uche. You the saying. church. The church, that's right. It's a church that is doing the pushing. The church is doing the aggression against the gates of hell. And therefore, Jesus is saying they will not prevail. They will not stop you from entering. You yeah. have the right to push through the gates. The, these gates of hell, these gates of death, these gates that lead to hell, these gates that lead to death. You have a right to push through if you are really the church. In fact, the purpose of the church is to push through that gate and to go in there and rescue those who are almost inside or almost on the other side of the gate. You get a picture. All right. So that it, 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 it begins to give you an idea of what the church is. The church is not a passive body that sits idly by and then waits for the devil to come and attack it. And then uh, we begin to fight back and begin to resist the devil. No. The church is the active one. He's the one taking the fights to the enemy. Uh, he is the one going and aggressively uh, engaging with the gates of hell and breaking through. That's what Jesus is implying here. Verse 19. Verse 19. Uh, Sister Uche, can you read that for us? Matthew 16, 19. <clears throat> Matthew 16, verse 19. Yeah. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Very good. Thank mm -hmm. you. So we leave one gate and we enter, we go to another gate. The gate we were talking about a moment ago in verse 18 is which gate? The gate of hell, the gate of death, the gate of uh, Hades. All right, that's a different gate. But Jesus says, and I'll give you the keys of, of what? The kingdom, all right? That is to say the kingdom of God. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of God. And whosoever you, the idea, well, the idea of a key is again a gate, but this time you, you are not fighting and forcefully beating in. This time you are deliberately and purposefully opening the door, all right? Whoever you let in will come in and whoever you refuse from coming in will not come in, all right? We are given the keys. So uh, remember what we're trying to do. What are the principles that 
lie under the church? What are the pillars that support the idea of church so that we can understand what the church is all about? And we said it's based on the proper identification of who Jesus is and that that is the permanent foundation of the church and that Jesus then proclaims himself to be the owner of the church and says that this church is set up for the purpose of fighting against the gates of hell and breaking through and opening it uh, so that the devil cannot, or the enemy who is on the other side, cannot withstand us from penetrating and, and uh, raiding his kingdom, if you like. And then when we have raided it and we have brought out people, we now have a key to open the kingdom. So that's what the church does. The church breaks into the kingdom of hell and then it rescues people and then it opens the gate of heaven to them. It has the keys, uh, the means of admission into heaven. Wonderful. All right. All right. So these principles help us to understand what the church is. So in the light of this, what is the church? Um, there are different ways of defining it. One is based on the meaning of the word. What does the word mean? Uh, uh, Colossians 1.13, I think it is. Colossians 1.13, uh, who will read that for us quickly? Let me see. Um, Precious, can you do that again for us? Uh, Colossians 1.13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? Please, can you read it one more time? Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? Yes. Who has delivered us? out of, okay? He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. He has rescued us. Remember the church is supposed to raid the kingdom of darkness, rescue people. So the church is made up of people who have been so rescued from the kingdom of darkness and then we are to open the gates of the kingdom so uh, and then bring us into the kingdom of his son. All right. So it, it's a matter of um, allegiance. It's a matter of uh, ownership. It's a matter of dominion. Who is ruling you uh, determines which kingdom you belong to. And uh, the kingdom you belong to uh, determines... Uh, uh, what you actually do with the other kingdom. Okay, so the matter of getting a meaning out of what the church is, the word church, what's the meaning of the word church? What do we mean when we say church? Sister Dockers, can you read for us uh, from First Peter, uh, First Peter 2, 5. First Peter 2, chapter 5, uh, verse 5. First Peter chapter two, verse five. verse five. Good evening, thank you. Thank you. Ye, ye also, I'm reading from King James. Yep. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Hmm. Hallelujah. Remember, what we're trying to do is to define or to find what about how the Bible defines the word church, right? And here in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, we see that it uses, um, 
an expression which gives us the impression or the understanding that the church can be likened to a building, right? You also like living stones. So each member of the church is like a, a living stone uh, being built into a spiritual house, okay? So the church is a spiritual house being built out of lively or living stones, which is his constituent members, to be a holy priesthood. So again, this spiritual house is supposed to constitute a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's how Peter describes or defines the church, all right? That's the meaning Peter gives to the word church. A uh, building, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, all right? Please pay attention to these expressions because we'll come to them again and again. It's a spiritual house, not a physical house. So a church is not the physical building, okay? Uh, you, you say, oh, we are building a church. No, you're not building a church. You're building a house, okay? Uh, oh, our church is very big. No, your church is not very big. It's your church building that is very large, okay? All right. So there's a difference between a physical building and a spiritual house. Yeah, the Bible says that the church is actually a spiritual house. So we measure its effectiveness by its spirituality rather than its physicality, all right? Uh, it's a holy priesthood, a holy priesthood. The word holy means that it's set apart for God, all right? Set apart for God. Uh, the church does not exist for politics. It does not exist for um, uh, social services. Uh, it does not exist for economic activity. It is set apart for God, all right? As a priesthood. A priesthood is uh, uh, an association of people or a group of people who uh, stand between God and other human beings, all right? Uh, a priest is someone who offers sacrifices to God, particularly on behalf of others. And that's why it says offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So that when we're saying our church is successful, the question you should ask is, are you offering spiritual sacrifices to God that are acceptable? Are you offering them through Jesus Christ? Are you set apart for that purpose? That your purpose, all right, of existence. All right, so that's one way to describe church. That's how Peter describes church. Let's see how how Paul describes church in Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Uh, let me ask uh, Pastor Juliet to read for us. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Pastor Juliet, would you please read? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes. Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 22. Yes. Okay. It's just... Um... Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, so it's a bit dark where I am. 
Oh, wow. Are you okay? Do we ask somebody else to read me well? Okay, maybe someone else can read. Okay. Can I ask uh, Angela to read as Angela Zinzi? Okay, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 and 23. Yes. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. Okay. Wives should be subject to their wives as the church is to Christ. Because Christ is what? The head of the church. All right? All right. So anything called church must be a, a body of which Christ is the head. All right? If Christ is not the head, if a human being is the head, then it's not a church. All right? Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. So the, the way Paul sees the church is that it's the body of Christ. And it is, uh, it is um, not just the body of Christ, but Christ is his head, just as the wife uh, is subject to the husband as the head. Okay, so let's leave that there. Revelation 19, 6 to 8. Um, Revelation 19, verses 6 to 8. It says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of a rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. So here again, the Bible refers to the, 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 the church as the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is one of the great mysteries that uh, we are waiting to see uh, to be revealed to us uh, how the church will become the bride of Christ. And uh, uh, that's really the purpose of, of the whole thing. That's what God is doing. That's why he created human beings. is to prepare a bride for his son. All right. Uh, uh, and, and right now, uh, the church submits to Christ just as a wife submits to her husband. That's what we saw in Ephesians 5. So the whole point is that the, 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 the church is subject to the headship of Christ. Okay, that's the whole thing about, about the bride. So we, we've seen that the church is like likened to a building. It's likened to a bride. It's also likened to a body. So Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Who is reading for us now? Ephesians 1. Pleasant place. Can you read for us? Ephesians 1, 22.
and 23. It's pleasant, yeah? Okay, brother Joseph, <coughs> can you read for us? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. <coughs> Ephesians 3 verse 4. Sorry. Okay. You are here now. All right, go yes. ahead. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Yeah. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. All right. And God placed all things under his feet, that is under the feet of Jesus, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Hmm. To be head over everything for the church. Of course, this is uh, referring to the ultimate purpose of God uh, that at the end, Jesus' headship over everything on earth will be on behalf of the church, all right? Because the church is his body. Just like a, a, a head is made complete by a body, uh, so is Jesus made complete by the church, all right? Because it says here, uh, 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 over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, the fullness or completeness of him who feels everything in every way. All right. So Jesus feels everything and he is appointed head over everything for the church, for the church on behalf of, of the church. So Jesus' headship ultimately, uh, 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 that is to say, Jesus' ultimate leadership over everything will be on behalf of the church. What a wonderful thought this is. All right. So here we have the church uh, made analogous to a building uh, or, or a bride or a body. All right. Uh, and these are all the ways of just seeking to describe what the church is. In the case of a building, uh, Peter is making it clear that the church is a spiritual house, a, a set apart priesthood that offers sacrifices that are acceptable to God. In the case of bride, we see that Christ is the head of the church. Uh, 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 and therefore is the bridegroom. Just like a wife relates to the husband, so does the church, or is the church expected to relate to Jesus? And then in the case of the body, we have this fantastic vision of Christ uh, being the head and the church being the body of Christ, all right? So that when Christ takes charge of everything, he does so on behalf of the church, his body, all right, which completes everything in every way, all right. So, what then is the church? Uh, we're looking at it, we have looked at it from the perspective of meaning, and we've looked at the analogy, all right. Uh, the function or purpose of the church is another way of trying to understand what the church is. When you know what a thing does or what is designed to do, you can use that to define a thing. What is a car? A car is a, a, a contraption which is designed to carry people from one look, people or loads, from one location to another, all right? Uh, that, that's, that's, we're just describing it on the basis of the function, what it does, 
all right, or what his purpose is. So if we use purpose or function, how do we describe the church? Okay, Galatians 6, 2. Galatians 6, 2. Um, Pastor Juliet, are you able to read for us now? Are you still in, in a dark place? Galatians 6. Okay, can we say? Okay, Galatians 6, 2. Okay. Galatians chapter 6. I read verse 2. Yeah. Be are one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay. Should I continue? Just a minute. Okay. Bear one another's burden. That's really the point we're trying to make there. Bear one another's burden. Uh, a church seeks to bear the load of each other. Uh, the reason why we don't isolate ourselves as Christians or keep ourselves alone is that you cannot bear your own load alone. We need each other. And particularly in this uh, way that Peter defined the church for us uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we saw that the church is a holy priesthood. All right? Uh, in that context, Bearing one another's burden will mean that we watch over each other. We keep an eye on each other. We seek to help each other become more and more holy. So we can perform the function of our priesthood properly. All right. So we watch over one another. All right. We bear one another's burden in that sense. All right. And in this way, we will fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, Revelation 19, verse 7. Uh, who has A52S? Uh, if you can read for us. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. Okay. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. Now normally uh, for a wedding, a bride prepares herself. And uh, brides usually wear white gowns. And the reason I'm told that the reason why they wear white gowns is that it's a sign of purity. And uh, they take time to make sure that they get uh, as white as white can be uh, in order to reflect this purity with which they're entering into this marriage. Okay. The same is true of, of the church. Listen to what he says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding lamb, uh, wedding of the lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. So who makes the bride of Christ ready? It's the bride herself. All right. So that's our task to keep ourselves holy, to help one another, to maintain this sanctity without which no one shall see the law, you know, to maintain this purity, which will help us to be acceptable before the law, which will signify that we are ready to be the bride of Christ. I think we will probably stop here for tonight and uh, we'll continue to look at other purposes uh, next week. Note what we have tried to do today is to try to understand what is the church, all right? Uh, after we introduced the subject by saying that uh, um, 
um, the, 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 the church uh, is best understood in the context of this being the rock, uh, being the foundation uh, of, of a building, uh, a rock set apart to contend with the enemy at his gate and overcome and free people uh, uh, and then open the gates of heaven for them to enter. We said now that in, in order to do that effectively, the church requires to be a holy body set apart for the Lord alone. We need to take time to preserve our spiritual identity because without it, we're just the world. We're not, without holiness, any group of people is not different from the world, okay? But with holiness, then you are the people of God. You cannot but be the people of God. We'll see the rest of the functions uh, next week. All right, back to you, Brother David. Thank you so much, sir. Um, for beginning the journey of the church with us. I think this is going to be very helpful. I want to open to questions now. If you have any question or contribution, this is the time to ask. That's right, Philemon. Bro, Philemon. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Muruti. Thank you, good, good evening. evening once again. Uh, very, very uh, interesting here, especially the foundation that you have laid under for, 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 for us. Uh, when you look at the beginning where you enter, uh, Jesus Christ seeks to know if his disciples understood mm. who he is. This is uh, what, when you look at even the, the, the body of Christ, even today, we still have this uh, uh, lack of understanding yeah. of who Christ is. Then that very, very basic foundation of understanding uh, where you started from, uh, it's, it's very, very, very crucial. In, you, you have really unlocked a very, very key point, uh, very, very key points there in the introduction. I just want to appreciate uh, uh, that Thank and you. hope people have going first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very important for us to uh, bear that point in mind uh, because that's how the Lord introduced. In fact, that statement he made there in Caesarea Philippi was the first time the term church is used by him. You know, uh, he says, I will build my church. All right. Other people may have their church, other religious leaders may have their group, but this is my own, all right? And he immediately introduces the fact that it will be belligerent, it will be fighting. Uh, uh, first of all, that it, like you pointed out, that is based on who he is, on who he is. If you have not identified the person of Jesus, you are really not a member of the church. You cannot be. You are not. So, uh, if I was a pastor, this means that I will go back and make sure that my people understand who Jesus really is, all right? Uh, the Messiah, the son of the living God, the concept of Messiah, the concept of being the son of God, which a lot of people criticize Christianity for, particularly our Muslim friends. And that is the very big danger of Islam, is that it denies the sonship of Christ. Here, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God, the son of the living God. Now, without that, without that understanding, you cannot be a Christian. And therefore, if a church is full of people who don't have that understanding, that group is not a church at all, all right? Uh, certainly, it's not the Church of Christ. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other comment or question? Uh, uh, hello? All right, Boyd. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think this is a very good topic uh, because the way we have taken church, uh, we have taken it literally without understanding. Uh, thank you so much, Uncle Peter, uh, for opening up uh, on this subject. Now, I just want you to elaborate more on the verse 19 from the same chapter of Matthew 16, where it says, um, whatever you bound on earth, it's also bound in heaven. Because uh, the way we understand some of us this, you find that uh, people sometimes misinterpret it such that they will excommunicate someone uh, from the fellowship using that same word. Because they think, like you said, uh, the church, some other people take it as theirs, not knowing that the church uh, belongs to Christ. So I would like to have uh, some more elaboration on that one. Thank you very much. Verse 19 uh, says, <clears throat> I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in mm -hmm. heaven. Uh, you look at that in context and you will see that it's all related to this matter of the revelation of Christ as the very basis or the very foundation of the church, all right? And secondly, that it is very directly related to the fact that the church is supposed to raid the kingdom of darkness. And then thirdly, to open the, the doors of the kingdom of God to people, all right? Now, in that context, when he therefore says, whatever you bind on earth, he's talking about binding people from entry into heaven and loosening people uh, to have access into heaven. All right. So, for instance, Jesus said, if you go to a place and you preach to a people and um, they, they, they don't listen to you, shake off the dust from mm -hmm. under your feet. He said it will be worse uh, for that city than for Sodom or Gomorrah uh, for, uh, on the last day, all right, on the day of judgment. Now, when you do that to a city and you shake off the dust from under your feet, um, that's it. They've had it. That city has had it. Of course, we're not supposed to be doing that uh, very uh, loosely or uh, without thought. Uh, it's a very major thing to 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 bind a city, if you like, in that sense, from entering heaven or bind a people from entering heaven. But we have that authority. We can do that, uh, like Jesus said to do, if a people do not receive us. Okay, thank you. And obviously, if a people do not receive us, then they don't receive our word. They don't receive our word, then obviously they cannot believe in Jesus. And if therefore they don't believe in Jesus, that fact alone has locked them out of heaven. But that is the thing that Jesus is talking about there, not as communicating individuals. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but Boyd, I also think that in uh, Matthew 18, probably that's what you're talking about, verse 17, mm -hmm. where a brother who does not want to be corrected and his offense has come to the church and he still does not listen to the church. The, the, laws, the church treats him as an unbeliever and whatever the church binds on earth will be bound also in heaven. I think that's what uh, the context in which you really want to talk about. Yeah. This, yeah. this is doable. I mean, uh, especially again, read it in context, okay? Mm. Somebody has offended and uh, his, uh, somebody oh, okay. has tried to, to show him the way or the light. He has refused or rejected that. He has mm -hmm. brought somebody else or other people that have tried. He has refused and rejected that. He's been brought to the church, to the eldership or leadership. He has refused to listen to the church. The church has a right to treat him like an unbeliever. All right. There are okay. others 
that where we are told to treat people like unbelievers, that when people become contentious and uh, do not listen to instruction, uh, they are to be treated as unbelievers. Those people can be, uh, the church has a terrific power, right? But it's not to be used carelessly yes. or abused. Oh, I get it now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Who has Hawaii Wi Fi light? Uh, uh, it's Pastor Stronger. Uh, I just Who wanted Pastor to stronger, comment. Pastor Strong, Pastor Stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, Joseph. You are stronger yes. than what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pastor yes. Joseph. I, I just wanted to add something on what the brother was asking. Uh, the brother should also know that uh, we are on earth, uh, where earthly things is also happening. So first, we need also to be testing the spirit of uh, what those people are in. So because if you test the spirit in what they are, then you know these people, they are not doing things like Christ strike. So if they are not doing like Christ strike, then uh, we need just uh, to see in our spirit of Christ that uh, these people, they are not doing like Christ right, and uh, they are doing extra things. So what they are binding, they are binding extra things. So sometimes in our spirit, we need to shift and move on with our mandate of becoming like Christ. With our doing, as uh, the evangelists are uh, doing Christ right, because these people, they don't understand it, or we need to make them understand what it means by binding on earth and binding in spirit or like clear strike. Thank you. All right, yeah. Joseph, thank you. My Dennis, we're so happy to have you back um, from Iswatini. Do you have any comment or question? Uh, good evening. Um, fortunately, good evening. I did get to hear the the study. I was I dropped out because we were having challenges here, so I, I only came back just now. So I don't know what was being discussed and what was being studied. Okay, we're discussing the church. Uh -huh. That the the Bible is the yardstick for which we measure a healthy church. Yes. Uh, how, do, how do we know the church belongs to, is the right church or not, will be determined by the Bible. So mm -hmm. we try to look at what is church in sense of service. Then we started with the principles of, basic principles that will help us understand the church. So first is precise identification to know who Jesus is. Uh, that's very foundational. That mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus had to ask his followers, his disciples, who people say he is. And uh, they had all kinds of revelations about what people say, but he also said, who do they say he is? Mm -hmm. And uh, Peter then said, he's the son of the living God. And the Lord said, on, based on that revelation, that foundation, he was going to build his church. And the word his church also introduced another principle, which says, Jesus is the owner of the church. Nobody owns the church. Nobody should say, it's my church. Mm -hmm. The true church belongs to Jesus. And we also saw that there is a principle of warfare. So the church is set up for a military purpose, to fight. And uh, because the Lord commanded we should go and make disciples, we we'll have to be confronting gates of darkness. It is a church who will be fighting those gates. And those gates will not prevail against the church. So the church should be going to gates and fighting in order to set people free. And to set the people free, we've also been given keys of what to do for the people to be free. So we went out to look at biblical analogies also of what the church is. The church as a house, according to Peter, the church as a body, according to Paul, and the church as a bride, even according to John. 
So basically, those are some of the things we looked at. And also that the church is empowered to, to preserve itself by bearing one another's burden and by mm-hmm. making herself ready for the coming of Christ. So basically, those are some of the things we've discussed tonight. Mm. Powerful. All right. Better. Precious. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ma. Precious. Yes. Um, my question is not for today's message. Okay. I have a particular confusion about something in the Bible. Uh, in Matthew, um, the Lord says, this is the Lord's prayer. We say the Lord's prayer, right? Um, right. Speak, and in speak it, out a little bit. Speak out. Sorry, maybe I'm doing louder. louder. I'm saying uh, in the Bible, when Christ gives the Lord's prayer, he says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yeah. So my confusion now comes in, is it Matthew 4, when Christ, after 40 days and 40 nights, when Christ had fasted, it says, then the spirit led him into temptation. So yeah. I'm, I'm confused that why would we pray for us not to be led into temptation when the spirit still leads us into temptation? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the thing is, um, have to understand what we uh, or what the Bible is referring to. Uh, sometimes the words translation, the way the words have been translated, cause a little bit of confusion as to meanings. Uh, when it talks about temptation uh, he is talking about difficult situations um, more than it's talking about being tempted by the devil we cannot help but be tempted by the devil we saw that when we were looking at spiritual warfare the other time uh, the fact that we are in the world already predisposes us to temptation uh, and uh, the Bible talks about when anyone is tempted. So we are tempted. It's not a matter of if anyone is tempted. It's when anyone is tempted. Okay. So that's clear. So when they say lead us not into temptation, it means more like lead us not into trials, difficult situations. Uh, 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 situations that will tend to overpower us or be difficult for us to bear, all right? Uh, that's really what it's referring to more than, uh, uh, you know, thinking that it refers to uh, a prayer uh, so that we are not tempted by the devil. Do you understand the difference? No, I don't really understand because the if, difference if it was is trials, wouldn't the Bible have said, do not lead us into trials? Some but translations. Said, that's what I'm telling you, that it's a matter of translation. All right. Go back to the original Greek. It's much the word there is much more referring to trial than temptation. And in some translations into English, it also refers to it as trial. Okay. Uh there is no, you can't avoid temptation is what I'm trying to say. It's impossible, all right? You live in the world, you will be tempted. So it's, it will be futile for us to, to uh, for God, for Jesus to tell us to pray against what cannot be avoided. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Yeah, so it, that's the reason why you begin to wonder, could, could that be a, a wrong translation? And when you go back to the Greek, you'll find that the word being referred to there is more like the issue of trial, difficult situations, difficult circumstances, all right? Like we'll pray, Lord, let war not come. You know, let's not be in a war situation. That, that's a trial, you know, uh, or a praying against illness. That's a trial, you know. Uh, that's the kind of thing he's referring to. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, probably maybe just to add on and help the sister. Uh, that prayer uh, which the Lord Jesus Christ told us uh, to be as a pattern of our praying, it's a guide to us as we pray such that we are not led into temptations. Because uh, she's mixing the two where Jesus was uh, tempted by the devil, uh, where he stayed even the, is it 40 days? Then he, uh, mixing with the, uh, the guide. So the guide is something that will guide you the way you move or the way you do things. So it doesn't mean, it literally means that uh, that is the prayer that we should be praying. But as we pray, we should pray. I thank you even for the elaboration that is see uh, a trial because eh, trials come in different ways. Because if we don't understand, then uh, we'll be just taking words literally than understanding them. Thank you. All right. The big problem we have really is with uh, translation. Uh, yeah. The English translation is not often the best in yeah. places. Thank you. Uh, it, I, is, I don't it, know if it also I goes to say the same in... with the issue of church. This is why we say I'm going to church. Yeah. Building a church. Yeah. So you see, when when you now look at that type of translation. You start wondering what should be the best word for, for that. It's, it is confused. We say today, exactly. we're going to church. We're building church. It's my church. Kind of thing. Thank you. So, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Sister Dokas, any comment? Unmute yourself, my see. Yeah. All right. Um, am I? Do you have any comment? Yeah. Um, am I unmuted? I'm trying yes, to unmute you myself. We're hearing okay. you. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much um, for this wonderful teaching. And um, hey, it's just wonderful. Um, yes. The issue of trials, I, I, I love it. As Pastor says it, that uh, we can't avoid the trials, but we need to be equipped. I look at at, um, at the word, the last word that we have we have learned just now to say we need to look after one another. Yep. Yes, we need to seek and look after one another to strengthen one another, so that even when these trials come, we are strengthened. We cannot run away from them, but we need to be strengthened with the knowledge. That's why we are learning to understand the basics, to understand what we are as a body of Christ. Yes, the trials will come, and in we, need, we need not to shun from each other's trials or from each other's um, challenges as they come in life. But we need to do that from the standpoint that we are one body, and we need to be jealous of one another, serving one another, protecting one another. Amen. That's what I Amen. Powerful point. Powerful. Thank you so much, Dr. Mufalale. Uh, the school has gone off. I think their light went off, but they're hearing us. Dino, do you have any question from the school? Dino, are you able to speak? Good evening, Good evening sir. Yeah, Hello. Evening. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I know there's no question uh, except that uh, everyone has been learning and taking notes from whatever that we were like learning tonight. So there's no question. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Somebody's hand is up. Who is that? Still see one hand up. Okay, Sister Yanda, yes, that's right. Is it Suche? Good evening, sirs. Good evening. How are you? Thank, God. Thank you so much for the powerful teaching. Okay, so um got two questions. Yeah, the first question 
uh, is um, should we then, since we are the church, you know, you and I, you know, us, we, we the living stone making up, yeah. being yeah. Up, you know, into a spiritual house, so we are the church. Should we then rightfully, when we are going to, a, you know, a Sunday service, should we then rightfully say that we are going to a fellowship, we're going to fellowship, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, and not say, I'm going to church. I, I know it's it's uh, it's a matter of semantics, you know, it's a matter of yeah. how people put it, but you know, in like because now the understanding is 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 not even there, you know. So we just figure, okay, we're going to church to a physical place. So, yeah. But the understanding should the understanding be, and and also the way we say it be rightfully yeah. uh, said, we are going to fellowship. I I would prefer that actually, or to uh, a meeting of the church. Oh, you know, uh, we're going for fellowship, very, very good, very accurate. Uh, we're going for worship, uh, very accurate. Uh, or we're going for Bible study, we'll be, we'll be more specific, you know. Um, the place is a building, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it, it's, not, it's not the building that... Uh, that is the issue because where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That constitutes a church, you know, Jesus, the head, the rest of us, the body. And uh, so the, the key thing is to get away from our mind. This idea that is the place that is the church. No, it's not the place. It's the people that constitute the church. Wherever they are, they are gathered or scattered. That's the church, okay. Okay, and uh, sorry, I've I've now had I'm now having three questions. It was two, as but now as we're speaking, another question is being raised in my mind, right. and that is uh, okay. So sh should we? Is it appropriate then to invite unbelievers to our fellowship? Yes, uh, we'll get there. Let me let me just say we'll get there. Um, All right. And uh, let's let's not uh, jump ahead of ourselves because that, there's a lot of foundations we need to lay so that we get a proper understanding of what we're saying when we say that. Yes. Okay. The number three. Then how, how should our fellowship be like? Um, because there was a way that um, you know the the early church used to um, you know fellowship. Yes. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just. So, so our fellowship yeah. should be like that. Should be like that. Mm -hmm. So, is the way that we're doing it now because it's different now. The way we're doing it and the way they used to do it is is vastly different. So, yes, uh, um, that's why we're doing this course so that we can identify what what might be wrong with some of the things we do and learn from the Bible the correct mm -hmm. things to do. Today, we have sort of laid the foundation. We've seen, for instance, that everybody must really be a believer in Jesus Christ before we say they're members of the church. We've seen, for instance, yeah. that uh, uh, our task is, is a militant task, that it's not a task that requires just sitting down. It's not a sedentary task. It's a task that involves getting active you know, uh, and it's against the gates of hell. And we've seen today, for example, that it is a matter of opening the gates of heaven to people, all right? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, so if we are to fulfill that, what kind of meetings ought we to be having? Obviously, it should be more like what it is in the Bible than what it is. In other words, um, we use that as a standard to measure what we are doing now, if you get what I mean, you know, to say what we are doing now. I don't know your particular church, for instance. I've never been there, but you have been there. So you can say what we are doing now, is it in keeping with the way the Bible says we should? Uh, uh, would it fulfill these requirements, these basic undergirding principles that we saw? If we carry on like this, 
Would we be achieving what the Bible expects of church? That's the question. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, sir. Sister Yanda, those are very good questions. And I believe Uncle Peter will handle them very well as we continue with the teachings. I will plead with every one of you, invite many people, extend the invitation to many people. This teaching on the church will be very helpful. Uh, we need to stop at this moment. I will ask uh, Pastor Juliet and Nago to please pray for us uh, before we play the, the last song. Sister Juliet. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Everlasting Father, we bless your name. We thank you for this revelation. Thank you for bringing us to a place of understanding of what the church is supposed to be. Lord, we are grateful. Thank you, Lord, for your servants that you have used. And Lord, we pray that you increase them more in the name of Jesus. As this word continues to come forth, Lord, establish us through your word. Let it begin to enlighten every darkness in our parts and give us clarity that every doubt will go be cleared in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the grace to continue in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sister Juliet. We will play just one song and then we'll be closing the meeting for the and night. Uncle Peter. Uh, somebody speakers are on, please. Uncle Peter, thank you so very much for being very available for the Lord to use, use you for us. We're so grateful. God bless you. Thank you. Our love to Auntie Moya and uh, the whole family. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, we want to close for the night. Thank you so much for staying till now. Victory belongs to Jesus. I want you to know that he is the head of the church, the head of his body, and it's our responsibility to keep submitting to him as our head. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord watch over you. May he prosper you, increase you, and enlighten you. May peace be upon you and your family. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 Amen.